So Deborah did such a good job describing uh, associate remote viewing and talking about what it is and how, the, how they're set up. One of the things that I first started thinking about is what's the most important part of the study? Is it the viewers and a lot of ARV research and a lot of remote viewing research focuses on the viewers? My question is, what's the role of the judges and does it make a, a difference? And also, how does the investment choice play into this, this whole process. Before I get into the study, let me first talk about the difference between prospective and retrospective studies. Retrospective studies, that's where you take a gather, uh, data that's already been collected and you try to run some analyses over it. So things like meta-analyses or something that are typically a good example of retrospective studies the data is already out there. We've already collected it. So let's just look at it and see if we can see any trends in the data, see if we can get information. A prospective study, on the other hand, it's previously designed, configured, the analysis methods are all defined. All of this is set up before any of the data is, is uh, ever, ever collected. Now, why would you do a, retro or a prospective study? With so much data available, with so much information around, why would we ever choose to do a prospective study? Well, when you're making decisions for a retrospective study, you have to decide things like, hey, what, what, um, which studies am I going to include? What are the different criteria I'm going to set up for the studies I'm going to include? Uh, and those things, that brings in an opportunity for more sources of bias within the study. In addition, uh, when you're doing a prospective study, it gives you a better foundation for exploring more factors that might be involved, rather than depending on factors that might have been done in other studies and working from what other people have already defined. The final thing that's really important about prospective studies is they allow for pre-registration. Within our field, it's very important that we maintain the integrity of our data and the integrity of our studies. One of the things that most of the sciences require or encourage is that you define everything and put all your information out there. So pre-registering, like somewhere like the Kessler Labs, where they have a pre-registration system, you take your design, you take your analysis method, you uh, determine what your sample size is going to be, and you put it all in the registry before you ever do the study. By doing this, whenever, you're, whenever, some people, whenever someone wants to evaluate the uh, qu quality of your study, they can go back and look at the pre-registration data, compare what your results were, and see how well you stayed within the parameters that you originally defined. You uh, can define things like your, uh, your criteria for significance, and if you change any of that, you define all that whenever you finish your, whenever you put your final report in there. So by doing this, what we're doing is we're adding integrity to our data, which is so important within our field. So let me tell you now about our study. This was a really typical ARV study. We did some, we just, took exactly what they were doing in the silver futures markets that they did back in the 80s. And the only variation we had on it is we had three viewers instead of one. But we had one, we had the viewers, we had one judge, we had an investor, and we had an, a, co a coordinator. They were all extremely experienced. Every, all the viewers had experience in remote viewing, had done it in other, and had done ARV in other times. The judge was very well established. In fact, some of these people were in this room, but they don't even know that they were part of the same study. Nobody knows. Everyone was blinded to who was involved with the study. Um, we used one stock for the investment throughout. What we did is selected a stock at the beginning, and we did it randomly. We were looking for something that was volatile. We didn't care if it was going up or down or anything. We just wanted it to change a lot during a week. What we do is we target the viewers on a Saturday and say, tell us what you're going to see next Friday. The viewers would do their viewing and return the information to our coordinator by Sunday night. The coordinator would take it, use ARV Studio, with, uh, which Deborah just defined, uh, use ARV Studio to get two targets, send the 
two targets and all the viewer data to the judge. The judge would look at it, make a decision on which photo matched. The coordinator would get the information back randomly using random.org, determine wh which, stop, which uh, image would represent an up stock and which image would represent a down stock. We'd then make the investment. Friday, we'd run through the week. Friday, we'd resolve the investment and the viewers would see the, t the target picture that actually matched uh, what actually happened in the market. They never saw the decoy image. In this study, it was all designed to make money. We're a nonprofit organization at the Rhine. We were trying to generate some funds. Unfortunately, in this study, we did not make money. We actually lost a bit of money, but it wasn't because there was a problem with the viewing or the judging or any of that process. It was because we're a nonprofit organization. We were limited in the way we can invest our funds. And the investment company we were working with told us, well, let me, they told us that we could do one thing and that was, we weren't able to short the stocks. So anytime there was a down prediction, we couldn't make the down predictions. So it ended up that we lost a little money. We did the evaluation as if we could make all the investments and we would have made probably about 5% increase in about 12 weeks. So there were 12 weeks of the study. That's the basis of the study, and that's about it, so I'm, I'm done. No, no, I'm not done. Okay, the interesting thing was actually the hidden procedures. Nobody in the study knew that this was going on except for me, and I was not involved with any of the process of doing the remote viewing. There was an additional judge and an additional investment instrument. This was a prospective study that was trying to determine how the judges compare to each other, is the judge, how important is the judge in the process? Is the investment choice important in this process? So every Sunday night, whenever the coordinator would get back all the viewers' data and the targets and send them to the judge, I would get the same information and I'd send it to another judge. The, so there were two judges, but each judge knew there might be a second judge, but mainly for a backup in case they couldn't do it one week. They both thought they were the primary judge for the study. They both thought that they were responsible for the investment. They didn't know what it, we were investing in. Nobody knew the stock. Nobody except for me and the investor knew what the stock was. And using the same protocol that I picked the original stock, we picked a second control stock to compare and see if there was a variation on this. So both, like I said, both judges thought they were the primary judge. The way we analyzed this is the results of the judges were compared. I wasn't interested in how the viewers did. There are so many studies on the viewers. We gave them their feedback so they could get their own information on how well they did. But I was interested in how the judging compared. So the judging data was compared for not only to see how they did with the main investment target, but also with the control investment target. And the results for the judges were extremely different. Looking at between the judges, the judges used different, one of the things about this study is that everyone involved was so experienced and so well steeped in remote viewing and within ARV protocol, I didn't want, I was trying to make money with this. I didn't want to try to tell them, do it this way or don't do it that way, use this method, don't use that method. I said, use whatever you're most comfortable with. So the viewers used multiple methods. There was a variety of different ways that the viewing was done. Judging was the same way. One of the judges was using a very intuitive process, another one was using a very structured, score-based process. But that's not exactly what, I wasn't trying to determine which one was better. I was just trying to determine, is there a difference within the judging? Well, one of the judges actually kind of hit flat at chance, 50% right across the board, half right and half wrong for what they predicted. The second judge, though, actually did really, really, only got one correct out of eight sessions that they judged. Now, I say this, the primary judge, though, hit four weeks in a row. That might not seem much. Four weeks out of 12, uh, it doesn't seem like it's very good. He had other weeks, too. But hitting four weeks in a row is a pretty good score. It's only, it's only like a 6% chance you're gonna get four weeks in a row. When we're talking about, though, 
missing. It was nine weeks in a row that the second judge missed and did not get the correct investment, or did not pick the correct investment direction. That's a very significant score in the wrong direction. It's what we call psi missing, right? So there was a very strong psi missing component to this. When I compared the judges on each of the investment targets, and I looked at them on, a pri on the main investment that we were actually investing in, there was a significant difference between the judges, and the judges were obviously being influenced by the primary investment. The control investment, they scored a chance both of them across the board. So the conclusions here are that the judges should be evaluated in a similar way that viewers are evaluated. We should consider even very experienced judges, judges that have been doing it for a long time, that have been using this method and have been having, we have to evaluate what their success rates are and evaluate whether, how, how they are interacting within ARV projects. They varied significantly, but only on a target investment, which tells me that the target that we set for the investment did have an influence. In the control investment, if we just pick any other investment out of the hat, we're less likely to, to have an influence on that. Now, the judge's methods can't be evaluated in this study, and also, this was an exploratory study. This, and so I don't think that we can really make conclusions on this, but this prospective methodology that we've used is something that can be used for future studies to determine how judging is important, how the investment choice is important, and how it contributes. I would recommend that regressions be run across these types of, uh, of factors in the future to determine the strength of each of them within a study. Thank you. I'm sorry to say that your description was when you got to the second hidden procedure was almost incomprehensible to me uh, because uh, your, partly your discussion of results, um, uh, the, the, the tables didn't seem to correspond to your verbal description of uh, the judges having a different performance on the targeted investment and uh, null performance on the control investment, I, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't clear to me where this control investment was coming from. Your initial description said, seemed to imply that the second judge was working on a second, on the other investment instrument. Uh, no, and no, no, given that also, yeah. with two investment instruments, how did you manage to pick only one feedback picture at the end of each week? So, okay, thank you, York. Um, if I wasn't clear, let me clarify. So, there was only one investment instrument used for the, pr for the project. Both judges were give pricking for that same investment instr instrument. I had a control investment instrument that I used, uh, it was post-study, I evaluated the control investment instrument with both judges as well. So it wasn't like one judge for one and one judge for the other. No, both judges had the same target to pick the invest, and they didn't know the investment instrument anyway, but the investment instrument was intentionally picked to be just a single investment throughout the whole project. Does that help a bit? Is that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Really interesting, and I'd like to see replications and continuation. Uh, it seems to me, though, that and I'm, I'm uh, you know, out of this field, but it seems to me you missed the main point. Um, and that is you've treated both cases as if they were independent uh, judged criteria. And we know that there's psi in the remote viewing. Mm -hmm. We are pretty sure that there's psi in the judging. Right. But there's also psi in running the experiment. Right. And so you as the experimenter uh, are probably doing some sort of manipulation of this whole thing. And I don't think you can look at it as just 
two judges doing their things with two investments. So, uh, I, yes, I get your point. And the experimenter effect is something that I'm, I'm very familiar with, and I do everything I can to step out of the process. But you can't. Of course you can't. But what I, what I, I was not involved with the coordination. I was not involved with moving things around. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I was taking the information and sending it to this judge, the second judge. I, we did pick the second instrument, but the second instrument was randomly chosen just like the first one was. So I wasn't involved in, the, in any sort of anything related to the second instrument except for the final evaluation. Mm -hmm. Yes, when I did my final evaluation, I could have been affecting the data. This was already collected at that point, though. So, of course, the experimenter effect's always something in there. If you've got an idea how to take, me, take <laughs> yourself out of the experiment, I'm happy to listen. I would love to, wish, <laughs> I'd love to have an answer. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much. Thanks, the, Phil. Um, I think the bottom line here is you, you, you're making a point about the importance of judges, no matter how the variations are that are overlaid on all this. In, in my own informal ARV work, I've gotten to the point where the judges I select are only people that have an artistic drawing um, aesthetic background. Those are the ones I use. And as, as far as the scales you have, like the Tart scale, I've thrown away number seven because you've got too much analytics in there. Mm. And I re re use only the sketches that are provided and not the verbal descriptions. Make it very simple and easy for the judge to look at and evaluate. So it's picture to picture. Forget the analytics. And this is what I find to be the most effective procedure for evaluating ARB targets where you have two comparisons, comparisons to make. And, and uh, that could very well be, Dale. And I know that when you do viewings, I know that you're very visual and you're very drawing oriented. And perhaps that influences what you, how you see the judging to be most important. Other people who do more text-based, they may find that it's better to look only at the text rather than at the, view, at the drawings. And it does depend on how artistic the drawings are and how the judges relate to it. One of the things that you're bringing out that I didn't talk about in here because it was kind of out of scope, but this led me to the, to the concept, and I think Deborah mentioned it as well. So much of what we do, not only in remote viewing, but across the board in parapsychology is based on targets and judging. And how much of our research is focused on target selection and judging and a pairing of these two qualities. In this case, it was very important, that the judging was very important in the process. And it does make me think more about the judges and how they relate to the target sets and how they can pick from viewers' information. Viewers, like you said, some people use, photo, use uh, drawings a lot. Some people will even go into paintings. Some people will actually just do text. How can one judge evaluate all of this different information? It's important for us to start thinking in terms of choosing target sets and judging and comparing these together and pairing the processes together. I don't know if that helps to address your question, but thank you. Oh, Garrett's running back up here again. Yes. Since the aisle's <laughs> open, uh, yes. I'll, I'll ask a follow-on question. Right. So you gave a good argument as to why this should be prospective. Yes. If it were retrospective, might that alleviate some of the problems that we were just talking about with the experimenter? If it were retrospective, well, then you still have the effect of the original experimenter, right? That we would right. have to. Right, but it's, it, that's historical. They did what they did. Now you're going to just have judges look at it and see what the judges say. You do bring in other, sor other potential sources of bias. When you're making more decisions and what data to choose and how to include it in there, you're still making more decisions, so you're introducing more potential bias points so in the process. It's a different set of problems. Isn't it? Yes, okay, it's a different set of problems. <laughs> I just have a general comment. I, as, I, as I hear about these descriptions of these ARV experiments, I realize that the par apparently uh, photos are used, using a photo uh, yes. source and so on. Mm -hmm. In our remote viewing experiment that was so successful where we made $260,000 30 days in the market, uh, we use physical objects. And so uh, from the intuitive side, when people get their feedback, where they get to feel the object and turn it around and really, you know, get into contact with it. Uh, I recall in the judging process that there were lots of comments about the tactile sensation 
of the target that we're going to see and so on. So, so I, I tend to have a bias that, that a good way to go is uh, forget the pictures but actually get handled the objects. I, I agree with you completely that real targets, things that you can actually feel, engage more of your senses. The convenience of having emailed targets and images going around sometimes outweigh it because our viewers and judges are all over the world. <laughs> they were literally all over the world for this project. But thank you for your comments. Yeah, to, to Hal's last comment, um, that's the problem is that, uh, particularly when you get into volume, finding additional objects that are enough different from one another that you've used before gets really challenging. Plus the storage of them can bit, get in, you know, insurmountable, <laughs> right? So from a, from a functional perspective, objects are actually very, very good. Uh, what is it? What is it? Stephen Schwartz says new, new, whatever it is, new something or other. Um, but uh, from a practical perspective, uh, they become unwieldy very quickly. I want to address what Dale said and what you said here. So let me go there first. So when I when I teach ARV, I put a strong emphasis on tar target selection, target pairing, and all the different dynamics you have to take into account to get a good target match. And if you don't do that, you're inevitably going to screw things up, right? So it's very important, and that's to emphasize your point, and we've had that discussion before. Mm -hmm. Dale's case, viewers almost universally produce both verbiage and sketching. And so the challenge here is why can't judges judge verbiage and sketching, both. I mean, if viewers can produce and judge, you should be able to evaluate them as well. There are certain rules that involve the judging process, and that is that generally sketching is the, is the highest and most successful way of matching things, but you can't ignore the verbiage, but you do have to take it, you know, the jury's out on some of the things they say. The one thing I do say about this is that there are viewers who only produce text, there are viewers who mostly only produce visuals, and then there's those who produce both. By far, the hardest ones to judge are the ones that only produce text, and usually they are verging on impossible to judge in many cases. Mm -hmm. So you at least need the sketches. And when Dale says he gets people who, who have these, you know, right brain artistic kind of talents, that's very valuable, not necessarily because of the artistic element, because they, have, they, are, they live in the world of pattern recognition and shapes and that. And that's where they, they come in valuable. It's because their perception is oriented towards the, the most successful kinds of results that you get from an ARV. So I think what you're emphasizing is the importance of the judge and the importance of the judge being able to judge related to the targets that are being selected and being able to work with the viewers and all across the board. The judge is really a very key element here. And I think Deborah's study and this study make it pretty clear that Judges should be focused on at least as much as the viewer's data. So thank you very much. Thank you, John.